Hello, I'm Lant Pritchett. I am the RISE Research Director, which is research into improving systems of education, which is a large scale research project interested particularly in the question of how systems of education can be constructed in order to accomplish better learning objectives. And it's uh, at the Oxford Blood Botnik School of Government. Today, what I want to do in this opening lecture of this uh, intriguing course that you're embarking on is mainly help you understand what it needs to be understood. That is, I can't possibly hope in a series of four small uh, units or, uh, or videos actually get you to understand everything that needs to be understood, but I want you to understand what needs to be understood. Uh, and hopefully this will motivate you to make the effort to understand the very important problem that faces us. So my lecture today is going to be in four parts, um, and each of these will be separate. First is what is a system approach and why a system approach? The second is a specific example of a system approach that we at RISE use, uh, an accountability approach to an education system, and it, can, it illustrates, I think, really well what a system approach can be, which is a specification of the actors in a system and how those actors are interconnected in a way that can, may or may not produce good results. Part three narrows in and uses the system approach to illustrate a particularly important concept that we call coherence. And the coherence is a property of the system and it determines whether or not outcomes within that system are achieved. And then finally in part four, I want to get a little less abstract and talk of four concrete empirical studies that illustrate the importance of uh, understanding systems when one goes to act in ways that hopefully uh, improve outcomes. So I'm going to start by talking about, <clears throat> so this is part one, uh, and I'm going to start by talking about something that I know a lot about, which is me. Um, and I happen to have uh, a disease or a health condition that's called ITP, autoimmune thrombocytopenia purpura. What that means is there are certain cells in my bloodstream that are meant to stop bleeding. If I cut myself or hit myself and there's bruising, um, your platelets are the first line of response that rush to the wound and help coagulate the blood. And I have too few platelets. So if I bump into something accidentally, I, I get this huge bruise. So we understand really well, and the medicine understands really well, the proximate cause of why I bleed too much. So we can observe the symptom, I bleed too much, <laughs> and the proximate cause we understand completely, which is I have two flu platelets. Now, uh, if one just focused on proximate causes and didn't embed one's approach to treatment in the knowledge that the body is a self-regulating system, one could easily look to sort of naive treatments. So, if the proximate cause of my bleeding is that I lack a certain kind of plate cells called platelets, why isn't the answer just give platelets or make more platelets? Uh, you know, focus on the part of the body that produces more platelets. Or you can take blood, you can <laughs> separate the platelets out and just hook me up to an IV and give me more platelets. So that works. Uh, my baseline platelet count is around 15. If you're a normal person, and I hope you all are, the normal minimum is 150. So you can see that I'm chronically far below the normal level. Um, but you could easily take a couple of bags of platelets, run them in an IV in an hour or two, and my platelets would go from 50, 15 to 40 immediately. And this is rigorous evidence. This could be demonstrated with an RCT. This is well-known knowledge. But then you have to ask yourself, well, then why isn't the solution to my chronic insufficient of platelets to just periodically juice up and take some platelets? Well, the question is, how long do my platelets stay high if I'm infused with platelets? And the answer is, <laughs> it's an autoimmune disorder. 
What an autoimmune disorder means is my immune system, which is one of the many systems that keep you alive by protecting your health from foreign agents that uh, want to infect your body, my immune system has come to believe that my own platelets are a foreign body. So if you infuse my body with platelets, guess what happens? There's a response of my immune system. My immune system has feedback loops that alert it to the presence of a foreign body. And my immune system says, oh my gosh, there's more platelets. We need to kill faster and better. We need to kill those platelets. So the time that infusing platelets works for me ranges from hours to days. So it's just not feasible to take the proximate determinate approach to just augmenting what is clearly missing in a symptomatic description way without taking into account the broader systemic reactions to the treatment. And hence, once you consider that there are other forces in my body that are waiting there um, in order and detecting and attempting to kill my platelets, the infusion approach doesn't work at all. Similarly, you could, you know, the platelets are produced in your bone marrow. You could ramp up the rate at which my body produces platelets. So we could produce more platelets. We could eat. Um, that would have exactly the same effect, which is if you ramp up my platelet production, my body's autoimmune system <laughs> ramps up its killing and the steady state number of platelets stays at the same amount. So <clears throat> the main point of this example is that you just cannot conclude from a non-systemic approach what the impact of what you're going to do is of taking some concrete action from its narrow proximate determinant analysis. You need to understand the system as system. And this is true, and this is why a variety of things that seem in some sense like common sense about your body and your health are pure quackery. So for instance, it's easy to say your body needs essential vitamins and nutrients. Yes, it does. <laughs> in which, therefore, I could market to you buy more of these pills that contain these essential vitamins and nutrients. That sounds plausible. If nutrients are good for me, if vitamins are good for me, I should take more of them, I'll be healthier. Well, that ignores the fact that your body is a self-regulating system, and if your body happens to have more of the nutrients or vitamins than it needs, your body just flushes them out. So mostly what you buy by buying vitamin supplements is really expensive urine. Um, even though the common sense is exactly right. You do need vitamins and nutrients, but you have to understand the entire system, systemic operation to understand what happens at various levels of nutrients. So um, now this is just a really simple analogy, but I think this is the most important thing that I want to say in any of these four lectures, which is all kinds of people are going to talk about fixing or reforming or improving education systems in a way that ignores that it's an education system that sort of waves its hands away and says, well, what we really need to know is that textbooks being in classrooms, let's just focus on textbooks being in classrooms. In some ways, that's exactly right. And in other ways, that's exactly wrong. Because if you don't have the answer to the question, why in the current operation of the system aren't textbooks in the classrooms, you almost certainly don't have a viable or valid proposal for ensuring that textbooks will be in classrooms because you haven't yet understood the system. So now, why do I think understanding education systems is so important? And the reason I think I just want to illustrate two things, and during the rest of the course you'll see lots of things about learning levels and the learning crisis and learning profiles. And so this is just a <laughs> very brief introduction. But the first thing is that we see that systems matter. We can show that in some sense exactly the same kids, when exposed to one country's learning system versus another country's learning system, have radically different outcomes. Radically different outcomes. So this figure that I'm showing on the slide is a, from a paper I did recently where we took PISA data characteristic of PISA data is it's normed so that the average OECD student is 500. 
there's a sustainable development goal that every student should reach PISA level two, which is 420. So 420 is kind of an established global minimum. And if you, and this graph, what this shows is that things we know, we know that kind of kids from more advantaged backgrounds are gonna do better in school. There's a variety of causal mechanisms whereby if you have more educated, wealthier parents, you are likely to do better in school. Um, and so the, the lines in this graph are showing across levels of socioeconomic status, kids do better. So that bottom orange line is showing how much kids do better on the PISA exam if they're in Zambia. The green line is showing what those exact same socioeconomic status kids in Vietnam do compared to kids in Zambia. And what you can see is that on a scale where 100 points is a massive difference, the difference between uh, the, the SES, the socioeconomic status, identical kid in Zambia and Vietnam is over 200 points. Basically, the typical child in Vietnam um, outperforms the typical child in Zambia. And not only that, <clears throat> What we're showing is that if you go to the far right of that graph, you see what the, what the elite of Zambia are doing. And the elite of Zambia are scoring about 350 by being exposed to the country education system that Zambia currently has. <clears throat> if you look at the green line, you see that the poorest kids, the least socioeconomic status advantaged kids in Vietnam are scoring about 420. So systems matter. These education outcomes are not just different across countries because kids have different resources across countries because kids come from different backgrounds across countries because of the social or economic conditions. Those are important conditioning determinants, but countries like Vietnam illustrate that it's possible to achieve radically higher learning results with the same or even higher levels of enrollment um, by having an education system that works better prima facie, you just can't explain the difference between Vietnam and Zambia, for instance, and I'm choosing Zambia, I could have chosen any number of other countries. Um, you can't explain that difference in terms of the kids. The kids just aren't different. Even kids that start life in roughly similar conditions are going to do radically better in the Vietnamese school system than in the Zambia school system, and that's important for their well-being and important for uh, everyone. This, so the first important point is a non-system approach can't begin to explain the massive observed differentials we see across countries in their performance. It's not explained by the kids, and this we'll get back to this in a second, and it's not explained by the differences in the proximate determinants. Um, second, and this graph is complicated, so I'm gonna to have to spend a few minutes on it. Um, <clears throat> a survey called the Demographic and Health Survey has added a literacy question where they ask women in their native language or whatever language they choose to read, whether, and this is a survey of adult women, 15 to 44, whether they can read a very simple sentence like farming is hard work or children should study hard. Four or five word sentence. This isn't reading for comprehension. This isn't reading for analysis. This is just, can you read? And so we can measure the fraction of women who read. And importantly, we can measure the fraction of women who have completed grade five, but no higher. So let's look at women that just have completed grade five, didn't happen to go on, but at least got through what many countries regard as primary schooling. And we can say what fraction of women could read then the important thing about the DHS is by having done repeated surveys over time and by interviewing a cross section of women of different ages in each survey, it can ask the question, what's the likelihood a woman born in a certain year and hence likely to have attended school at a different year, having completed grade five can read? And the answer is <clears throat> that on average, over the kind of 30 to 40 year horizon we can cover with the DHS data, and I didn't do this research, this was done by three authors from the Center for Global Development, 
Um, uh, the answer is that the fraction of women who complete grade five and then later as adults can read has been declining over time quite significantly. So in the middle of that very complicated graph is the figure for the average and the average fraction of women that can read has gone from having completed grade five has gone from 78 percent, which is kind of what we would hope. We've always imagined that everyone who finished primary school would have some basic literacy. It's fallen from 78 to 64 percent. Now that at the same time, and this is the importance of country systems, that has a huge range of different experiences. Up in the upper northwest of the graph, we see Guatemala. Guatemala, and then on the, by the way, on the horizontal axis is the fraction of women who attended grade five or higher. So on the horizontal axis is coverage. On the vertical axis is learning, uh, a, a, a measure of learning. Guatemala, GTM, which is in the up northwest, has always had very high uh, reading levels and has massively expanded. So now pretty much everyone in Guatemala goes to school. Pretty much everyone in Guatemala who goes to school can read. They've just maintained their learning while expanding. We see Vietnam, VNM, as improving a lot. It has gone from having a little less than 80% of the cohort of women finishing grade five or higher to nearly 100%, while at the same time moving to very high levels of reading. So they have caught up on Guatemala by improving the learning levels. Now, worrisome is that many countries like Zambia, the learning levels in Zambia are not low because they have stayed low for a very long time or they have only risen very slowly over time. Learning levels are low in Zambia because they have declined massively over the last 30 years. However it is, and whatever it is the education system in Zambia has been doing, it has been increasingly less likely that a woman attending primary school for five years emerges from school able to read, and it's fallen from something like uh, for the cohort of women born in 1954, it was about 60%. Uh, the cohort of women born in 1998, which would have attended school sometime in the 2000s, and hence were young women when they were interviewed, it's fallen to less than 20%. So <clears throat> what this illustrates is we need to have an explanation before we go about acting on education reform. We need to have an understanding of why is it that some countries are in current terms producing good learning outcomes versus bad learning outcomes? And second, we need to understand why have countries arrived at where they are from very different trajectories? So there's some countries that have started at a high level, moved higher. Some countries have started at a high level, stayed high. Some countries have started at a high level and deteriorated slowly, like Nepal that starts with very low coverage, has massive expansion with coverage with very little deterioration. Other countries have deteriorated massively. These are properties, <laughs> these, these differences in country trajectories uh, really just cannot be understood without having an understanding of how the system is operating to produce those outcomes. So let me say one more thing. Um, about systems, because what systems are trying to help us do is understand, and this is a very awkward phrase, but uh, uh, understand the proximate determinants of the proximate determinants. So there's a very large literature in economics and in education generally that sort of establishes the correlations or sometimes causations between various characteristics of the school a child attends and their learning outcomes. So we can look at does a child who attends a school with a teacher with a university degree learn more on average than a child who attends a school or who's a child whose teacher doesn't have a university degree. So we can think of learning outcomes as some general function, I'm not specifying <laughs> uh, um, 
particularly what that is, whether it's linear or reactive, of things like uh, teacher qualifications or um, input availability or school infrastructure. Um, and this literature now <laughs> encompasses literally thousands of papers of this type that establish these correlations and causations of learning outcomes. However, <laughs> this is sort of exactly like understanding that I bleed too much because I don't have enough platelets. That's exactly true as approximate determinant. But if I don't have an answer, why do I, does my body have two flu platelets, I can't possibly emerge with an effective, non-harmful therapeutic treatment to my platelets. So it may well be you say, well, geez, <laughs> students learn modestly less with teachers with lower qualifications. Therefore, we should invest time, money, effort, energy in improving teacher qualifications. Uh, unfortunately, there have been massive efforts of very many different types around the improvement of what I call the thin inputs, the easily measurable inputs into schooling, that have not paid off. So even though it looks like from correlation or even causal evidence that changing the proximate determinant would change the learning outcome, what they haven't incorporated is a, a well-articulated and correct causal model of why the textbooks were missing in the first place, or why teachers lacked qualifications in the first place, or why it was the school infrastructure was weak in the first place. And my argument is without that understanding, you can't possibly move towards um, effective action that would improve learning outcomes. So that is why systems are the dramatically important part of understanding that we need today for acting effectively to uh, ameliorate and ultimately eliminate the learning crisis. Thanks.